Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience. As I said, my name is Allison Burstein. I work in the Adult Programs Department of the Education Division here at the museum. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to what is sure to be a thought-provoking and engaging conversation about a wide range of vital issues from our two speakers. So just a few words about our speakers. Tonight, we have Michaela Angela Davis, who is an image activist, writer, and the creator of Mad Free, which is a multi-platform, multi-generational, critical conversation project. For over 20 years, Michaela has been exploring the power of beauty, urban style, women's politics, and hip hop culture. Melissa Harris Perry is a professor at Tulane University, where she is the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Project on Gender, Race, and Politics in the South. Her new progressive talk show on MSNBC called Melissa Harris Perry is, airs this weekend. <laughs> And with this show, her position on this show, this will make her the only tenured professor in the United States with a cable um, talk Woo! show, a cable news show. <laughs> That's probably a good reason for that. She is also the author of a new book, Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America, which will be a large part of the conversation tonight. So without further ado, our two speakers. We're happy. We're happy you're here. And we so, oh, particularly- so much pressure. I know. <laughs> but, but you know what? But this, but, but in terms of so much pressure, look at the pressure that, like when you're talking about your practical, actual work, like you right. practically wrote a book, you're right. practically right. Right. A, 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 a professor, but what you had to navigate to get there, sure. that's the business, you know? And so we, we feel that, um, that it, it couldn't have come at a better time, particularly, you know, I'm gonna talk just briefly about the show, it couldn't have come at a better time because the politics are crazy right now, particularly, you know, as it relates to women and women of color. And so your lens is going to be so important, like right now. So that's super great. But the book and um, how, how did you get to this book? Why this mm. book? Why now? And how hard was it to sell a book about American politics through the psychology of black women? Like who wanted oh, that book? Right. Okay. Um, so the, the answers are all so unsexy. I don't, I don't even really know where to start. Um, so, you know, why this book? Because I'd, I'd written the first book and um, got tenure with it. And if I wanted to keep my job, I was going to have to write another book. Okay, there um, you go. That's practical. Like that, like at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the least sexy aspect of it. And so, um, so I, I sort of started writing a second book. And what happened is I'd, I'd gotten radicalized in the seven years that I was teaching at the University of Chicago. So I kind of left grad school and went off to my first academic job with a race lens um, and really sort of seeing myself as a race woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to write about, I mean, I, I think there's, you know, there are things about that first book that I really love and things about it that I find really appalling. Um, and one of the things about it that I find really appalling is that it, it didn't even occur to me as even slightly problematic that I was writing about barbershops mm -hmm. as a fundamental site of discourse in black communities and where black people get together and have ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, as part of doing that work, I initially tried to do Zora Neale Hurston kind of work. I tried to do the participant observer, right, right. anthropological research in the barbershops. And it was such a problem, I kept changing the space so much every time I would enter it, that I um, partnered with a really brilliant graduate student who's actually, thank God, a really fantastic intellectual and a feminist and all these things, mm -hmm. but, but it was also male, and sent him into the barbershop and we did this kind of ethnography by proxy, right? Which led to an interesting chapter and one that I'm very proud of in the first book, mm -hmm. but like, seriously, I gave up a whole part of my book because my female body could not enter into the space that I wanted to study Right. And I didn't have a sufficiently critical feminist lens to even see that as problematic, right? Right, right, right. <clears throat> but then I spent seven years at the University of Chicago with Kathy Cohen. And any of you who know the work or the person that is Kathy Cohen, who is an out black lesbian feminist political scientist empiricist genius, who also never like really lets you rest. So at any point that you're thinking that you've done a great job, Kathy's always like, no, how about do a, a better job, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so during those seven years that I spent with her, I really developed um, a, a broader conception of, of the places I was missing in my own political analysis. And so I knew the second book was gonna have to be about black women right. because I was working it out for myself and for my own work as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. But I've been writing this book forever. I mean, I've been writing this book 
for a really long time. When I think about who I was at the moment that I first collected my first data for this book versus who I was the day that it came out, it's almost, um, um, I know there was a, a, a recent critique of it that it was wild and out of control. Um, and it's, you know, it is isn't certain. <laughs> that, that is so loaded. It, well, no, but, no, I mean, it is, it is, but it's also like, you know, a part of the reason, I haven't responded much to that particular aspect of the critique, but, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit of it that's not completely false in that I was, I was in this book like really trying to work out a bunch of stuff. Um, but the question of was it hard to sell it is surprisingly no, mm -hmm. because it's an academic book, which right. means I'll make no money from it. Right. Right. So, um, like, I'll make a little tiny. Like, I probably bought these shoes, um, right. you know, with the book or something. But um, because it because it, because it's an academic press without a money making endeavor associated with it, right. um, it, it actually was less hard to find a publisher than one might expect. And I, I have funny publishing stories about the book, but it, it wasn't. Um, you know, that aspect of it wasn't the struggle. I think for me, the single hardest part of the struggle was trying to figure out what I was writing about, why I was writing about it, what was motivating me. And I think that's why it ends up the way that it is. That's why it's literature and, cult, you know, lit crit and politics and all of these different things, because I was working all of that out. But, but what's it, it is layered, you know, but we're layered. So in a way, I, yeah. when I was reading it, it didn't read like a straight academic book to, right. to me, right? And because Good. also the emotionality is in there. But I completely got, because I feel like this book is for black women. Like, and everybody else who loves black women can get it. But I, so Good. because I'm a black woman, I get all the complexities. And yeah. I get how you can go from Zora Neale Hurston to statistics to, you know. And, and, but you do it in a clean way. And there, there's some broad um, ideas that I just I want to ask you about. And um, particularly this notion of the politics of recognition mm -hmm. and um, misrecognition and the recognition and misrecognition of black women in American society and, and, and politics. And um, I want to... This is my only reading. Um, I'm going to read a quote. And for, for those of you who were at the last one, saw me suffer because I didn't want to wear my glasses. But I can read this, and I highlighted it in everything. So individuals denied access to the public realm or whose group membership limits their social possibilities cannot be accurately recognized. An individual who is seen pr primarily as a part of a despised group loses the opportunity to experience the public recognition for which the human self strives. Further, if the group itself is misunderstood, ding, then to the extent that that one is seen as part of this group, that seeing is inaccurate. Inaccurate recognition is painful, not only to the psyche, but also to the political self and the citizen self. Talk about that. <laughs> Boom. Uh, uh, right. Um, so you wrote it. <laughs> right, right. That's why I was like, "What did I write?" Um, so you know, this was this was the single hardest decision I made in the book. When I first started writing it, it was a book about resource disparities, um, which is which is the book that makes a lot of sense to write about black women. It was about the educational inequities. Right. It was about the housing inequities. It was about the um, the very real material inequities mm -hmm. that African American women face. And so that's that's the book I started writing, right. kind of mapping all the stuff we don't have. Right. And then August 29th, 2005 happened. Mm -hmm. And that was the day the levees failed in Katrina, um, after Katrina in New Orleans. Yeah. And um, it completely, obviously it completely altered my life, mm -hmm. um, but it also completely altered the book because what was happening for me in the context of Katrina was in part about resource dis disparities, but only in part about it. And the pain that I was experiencing watching it was about the misrecognition. Mm. Um, it was that when I was watching what was happening, I saw people who looked obviously like Americans to me. Like they looked like my cousins and my parents and my siblings and they looked like me. And when I saw them 
there, there's, a, there's an image um, that a lot of Katrina scholars have used. It's of an elderly African-American woman who appallingly, of course, her name we don't know because her name isn't important. The only mm -hmm. thing that's important is her body, right? So we just mm -hmm. use black women's bodies without any knowledge of their biography. But she's sitting at the Superdome awaiting rescue and she's got the American flag wrapped around her. And it's a huge flag, right? And, and so the question is, where in the world does a black person get a flag like that? Because, like, we don't do Fourth of July, right? We don't, that's, right. that's not really... <laughs> Right, that's not, that's not where, and if we did, like we only have done that post 08, right? right. Like maybe in 08 we're like, right. right. <laughs> so, 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 so one, if your house is flooding, if the water's coming up, why would you grab a flag? And how would you know where the flag was? Like even if you did do 4th of July, wouldn't it be up with like your holiday stuff? Somewhere this is at, right, this is the end right. of August. Where, so what, what is that flag? Right. That flag is from the casket of a veteran. Because the only way you know where a big, huge, ginormous American flag is and where you would go and grab it as you ran out of the house right. is because it was draped on the casket of your loved one. Which means not only are you a citizen, you're a citizen whose family has made the sacrifice that we consider the primary sacrifice required mm -hmm. for engagement in the American project, and you're sitting there wrapped in the flag of a veteran waiting for people to rescue you, and they're calling you a refugee. And it's not even that there's anything wrong with the language of refugee. In fact, had we in fact been refugees, we would have been better off. Word, right, right. Because the, cause there are international policies that require that you don't, for example, put a refugee on a bus with a one-way ticket, right? right. But in IDPs, internally displaced persons, don't have those same rights. So it's, it's not even so much that, it's, um, that there's something about being called a refugee that is in and of itself inherently... Um, degrading, but it is simply a misrecognition. It's false. Right. That, right. that woman and so, many, and, and so many of the other men and women around her were citizens. And so I was, it, it was watching people say that black men were raping babies in the Superdome when that, that was exactly the opposite of what was happening. Black yeah. men were saving babies all over the city because nobody else would. And in fact, the reason they wouldn't save babies is because they said that criminal activity was more important than life-saving activity, so they literally shut down all life-saving activities and went to law and order. Like, yeah. I, it was watching how the misrecognitions had real-time material policy life consequences, and on the one hand, wanting to talk about that, but also just wanting to talk about the fact that it hurts, and nobody yes. cares that it hurts. Like, you know, when you say, oh, that experience is painful for black women, people are like, so, I mean, like, so why am I meant to care that an experience is painful for you? Mm -hmm. So why should I care that, you know, we misrepresent you with a Soho abortion commercial? Why should I care that we misrepresent you on a Super Bowl commercial as irrationally angry? Or why should, you know, why should I care that, that your feelings are hurt? And so part of what I wanted to make a claim for is, like, our feelings being hurt is politically relevant. Well, and that, that's, that, that, and all of this is in the book, y'all. She's not just saying, oh, I was inspired by it. Like, she, it, the whole Katrina thing is broken down, so you need to get with the book. But, but, um, but also, the, I was struck by, by, again, by the emotionality and, and you talking about um, black women having this quest to craft meaning out of their lives inside of these really literally dangerous terrain, whether it's physically dangerous or sexually dangerous or psychically dangerous, but also that their emotional lives how their emotional lives lead to political choices. Right. And I have not seen that connection made before. First of all, I didn't have the distinction called the politics of recognition. Like, even though that's what I, t as an image activist, that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. So I just, thank you, you've given me some more language but to give context, but, but this idea of having to talk about how emotional lives lead to political choices. Mm -hmm. Like, that, um, how, because like, how we did get you it. get, yeah. I was gonna say, we get it, right? When white men are angry after 9-11, we go to war. Right. 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 So, right. so it's not that we, that we don't understand at all the idea of mm -hmm. emotions leading to politics. Like but we, no one's talked about it in terms of black women. Exactly. Right. 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 So like we get that the Tea Party's angry. And because they're right. angry, they're going to do a set of things, right? We get that, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, elderly Americans are scared about Social Security. So, right. So we talk about emotion and politics all the time right. if we think that the people having those emotions 
are relevant, worthy, right, and right. worthy. Right. That's right. Worthy of worthy of us caring what their emotions are. Right. But black women, when they have emotions, are like almost by definition irrational. Like our anger is always irrational anger. We, we right. never anger angry about something. Right. Right. We're just. We're just right. angry, right? Right. Just right. like in hand, like in our being, we just are angry, right? Yes. And and you do and and th there's some really healthy context that you provide about um, you know being able to understand these myths and realities about black women and, and you know and you can have the sort of classic um, Jezebel, Mammy, and Sapphire as, as you know as a construct, um, but it goes it goes deeper in terms of like breaking down these myths and realities. And what I found really interesting, because you know we've studied you know, the Mammy and Jezebel and stuff, but this idea of, you brought in another term, um, that the politics of respectability. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, talk about it. Like yeah. this idea of, and, you, get, and you, you give real context to why we feel this way, but also, can you sort of speak to that, this idea of the, the, the politics of responsibility, uh, respectability? Right, so I mean, again, that's, that's borrowed from um, previous black women academics. And, and again, one of the insights here, so I'm coming um, just at this moment, you know, we're coming off of Black HIV Day when we're sort of thinking about the continuing um, role that HIV and AIDS are having in black communities. Yeah. And so again, this is just bring back to Kathy Cohen for a second. So her argument is in part that because we're so wrapped up in a politics of respectability, this notion that you deserve to be a citizen, not just because you deserve to be a citizen, but because you somehow earn it by being sufficiently respectable. Right. So like the, to me, the most recent kind of clear iteration of this is, um, you know, Bill Cosby, remember when he went crazy and he told like black young people they were, he did. right, he, he was like, crazy. no, I mean, like I really think he went crazy, like literally like, probably post-traumatic stress kind of, yeah, yeah, like I mean, like something, something happened, something snapped. Yeah, well, right, right, I mean, yeah. he, you know, he lost his son and then, he, yes. and then what he does is he then blames young people themselves for kind of the you know the the failures of the post civil rights generation, so you have to stop naming your children these ridiculous names. You have to stop letting your pants sag. Like as soon as you hear pants sag, you have entered into the land of politics of respectability, right? Like if you're looking right. for a a little Q word about politics of respectability, it's sagging pants. You go, oh, <laughs> right? Because I'm just telling you that you know. In Jim Crow, everybody's pants were up, and they still had to sit on the back of the boat. Like it's just it's it's a re it's just such a ridiculous sort of <laughs> statement. Almost also always whenever you hear somebody start talking about hip hop, like if they're talking, if they have said something racist, and then they begin to talk about hip hop, they are employing this politics of respectability, right? Where you're not allowed to be free and equal just because of who you are. You have to actually earn it, and by conforming to certain sorts of norms. So right. what that did for us. As, as a community coming out of, for example, the civil rights movement, is much of the mid-century civil rights movement was powerfully a politics of respectability, right? It, it yeah. was, it was an, I was looking again at the pictures of Ruby Bridges and of Elizabeth Eckford mm -hmm. in, um, in New Orleans and in Little Rock in their starched you know, skirts and the going off to school and the bows in the hair. And part of it is how could, you know, the racism that was displayed against those little six-year-old girl bodies mm -hmm. in their starch skirts and their bows in their hair was so appalling because they're obviously little respectable citizens, right? Yes. But the fact is that when we display that same kind of racism against a 19-year-old with his pants sagging, it ought to still invoke for us the same level of discomfort. Mm -hmm. So we allowed, in many ways, HIV to go unaddressed as a political and social issue in black communities because we didn't want to talk about what we saw as disreputable aspects of the community, right? right. We didn't want to talk about LGBT um, individuals within black communities. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to talk about prison. We didn't want to talk about mm -hmm. um, intravenous drug use. Like we, because we didn't want to think of those as arenas in which the contemporary civil rights movement would be Operating, we just sort of was like, doo, 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 doo. What, but the what, idea that your identity has to be a secret, right? That and, and that's so we have to we have to kind of work on the top level because it's so well broken down in this book. So if you if you get it, you'll get it. Um, but w one of the things that um, you also do, which is which is helpful, particularly for young scholars too, is that you 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 um, sort of underlie, or you lay out, actually, the social benefits 
of the larger community or white society from these myths, right? Like you make it clear, for instance, you, you, you make it clear how, you know, black women's hypersexuality gave room for the white purity myth, you know? And so there, you do that several ways. So it doesn't, what it does is it brings some dignity to these myths because you see why they needed to happen in order for the society to, to promote their desires and everything from welfare to like you really help understand and the more you understand it's why mammy it be a- it's why mammy always shows up at very particular moments right? <laughs> right it's like you know mammy shows up right after the civil war there's no mammy myth before the civil war right she shows up in reconstruction because she has to heal the nation right yes. so you need this sort of um, romantic remembrance of the happy slave right mm-hmm. mammy showed up this year, right? If Mammy showed up. She, Mammy she, might get she a gold. Like, bam! She like came out, right? Because <laughs> because we're because we're in an economic crisis, right? Yes. And if you're in an economic crisis, what you need is Mammy, right? You you if people, for example, are asking for labor rights, right? right? If labor unions are battling for fair working conditions, then you need to romanticize someone who worked just because she loved you. Word. She ain't need no. Contra- Mammy didn't need a contract because right. Mammy was part of the family. <laughs> <laughs> she just wanted to see you succeed, right? right. So, so like, and, le- and let's say let's say you have a difficult, you know, sort of economic structure, and you're not quite mm-hmm. sure how to navigate it, and 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 social roles are changing. I mean, who better than a magical negress, right? Who, despite the fact that she has no. Um, no control over her own resources or, or very few resources of her own, right. really, her, really the only thing that fulfills her is making sure that your household is in order, your yes. children are well-loved, your spouse is well-fed, right? Like, I mean, who doesn't want Mammy? Right. I want to make. I need to come mammy. and just right, make you some pancakes and give right. you some advice. And, right. Uh-huh. No, and... <laughs> It's it's true. Like you, it, there's a there's a hilarious photo in there of the Mammy restaurant where you actually oh, yeah. get to get under her skirt and have yeah. a good meal. Like it's yeah, in crazy. Natchez, Mississippi. It is it it, there, it it exists right now. You drive down to Natchez, Mississippi. There is a Mammy restaurant. They have lightened her complexion over the years. It's fascinating. But you, right. the, the restaurant is in her skirt. It is. It's in you her go, skirt. You go into her skirt and you eat. You know, like home cooked Mammy food. Mammy food. <laughs> you get a Mammy meal. Um, so. So, um, <laughs> no, I mean, Q, but, when, when the help came out, yeah. I mean, I think the thing that really took me over the edge was that QVC had products inspired. Come on. You Do they have go, a mammy meal? You said like a little, little product, chicken little. That's right. Products inspired by the help, which if you wow. identified with the white woman in the movie meant they had like cute outfits and adorable shoes. Oh, that's right. That's a very, banana. Okay. But, but they also had waffle irons. And no, I swear. I wish, I wish it were a lie. I wish it were not true. Wow. Wouldn't you like some products inspired by the? Help? Well, you know, we hear that it's coming to Broadway, so we might have uh, help the musical. Um, but, but. Uh, <laughs> and and see and hey, I, okay. And the thing is, like, I'm actually not the fun police. Like, I actually wish that there were some place I could go and just, like, sit and watch a movie. Yeah. Or yes. watch a television show or listen to some music and not be assaulted. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's right. part of... It's, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking for everything to be Daughters of the Dust, right? right. I mean, right. I'm, like, I'm really not, and right. that's, that, that's not the standard. But the fact that every sort of, like, black family movie is actually a movie about how black women are temptresses yes. and, you know, how... I mean, if, if anything, could just be like... You can't... There's no, there's no comfort. Like, you, there's some part of your body that's having problems, you know? And, and, and uh, there's also a part um, in the book that you... T- that you talk about the stress of shame, yeah. you know, and I, I've, you know, I've read about the, the stress of, you know, poverty and the stress, of, but the, the actual stress of shame, and, and even as, and you're, we're speaking to that a little bit, like there are times when I feel stressful 
watching these images being perpetuated or these conversations about us or that, you know, this whole idea of misrepresentation. There's, there's a stress related to that. Mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, it's physiological. Cortisol. Yeah, there's Cortisol a chart in everything. Your body. In there's a chart. <laughs> there's a chart. No, it, so, I mean, it really, it's helpful because it also helps to, you know, liberate some of these ideas. And, and, I, and you sort of end in this place with, of course, with Michelle. And, you know, this and the journey of Michelle and also making all the comparisons to Michelle, to Jezebel and Mammy and Sapphire and, um, and also what was interesting of this idea of the angry you know, black woman in the White House and, and also how Michelle sort of, how you related to Michelle with your experience in the academy and at Princeton. Like, can you talk about that? I'm not, I'm not this was not, I was not gonna, this conversation isn't gonna go there, but it yeah. was interesting. Like yeah. it's in here, so we can go there a little bit. Right. I mean, um, only that really, you know, do you remember the moment when Michelle's senior thesis became public during the 2008 campaign? And there was this narrative about her as sort of un-American because um, she'd been very critical of her experience at Princeton. Right. And, and basically she makes a, a statement that says something like, um, my teachers will always see me as a black Princeton student, not just as a Princeton student. And so all I do is I take um, one of the sort of segments, uh, uh, passages from her book, and I try to set it next to Du Bois talking about double consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. And just, you know, just to sort of say that, like, for audiences that had ever either actually experienced or knew the scholarly work of Du Bois, it's not really that surprising to hear that a black woman in an environment like Princeton would feel a sense of double consciousness, right? right. Both that attachment to, but also that concern about always being seen through the, you know, the eyes of, of pity and contempt from others, right? So, right? so that we just sort of like, you could hear that and it would just sort of wash over you almost like a non-event, like, oh yeah, you know, Michelle felt alienated at Princeton and today is Wednesday. I mean, it, it wasn't, <laughs> but, but for other ears, the idea that an African-American woman from the south side of Chicago, which is of course an exceptionally middle class yes. community, right? right? But you know, out, you know, up from the south side <laughs> would would um, would come to Princeton <laughs> and feel anything other than absolute gratitude, right? Anything other than you know, dare I say it, bootlicking gratitude, right? That someone had taken her out of her circumstances and placed her in the hallowed halls of the Ivy League, and for me, it, it, it it's that kind of um, that's again a kind of moment of misrecognition. Like you, you just couldn't even hear what she was saying, which wasn't I hate America, it was I experienced a sense of Du Boisian double consciousness, which again is sort of such an ordinary part of black women's life experience that it, right. it was, the, you know, the other moment was when the, the fist bump, right. you know, post North Carolina, and everyone's like, oh yeah, the fist bump, and then kind of moves on. Mm -hmm. But then the next day it becomes the terrorist fist bump. Right. And then there, there was just to see, Okay, so I'm not even going to go into the other one, but um, so I think, um, but I think again, that's kind of, I, I just want to reconnect that just a little bit to the politics of respectability, mm -hmm. because part of it has to do um, with the claim that we might, within black communities, possess resources that are valuable for esteem building that don't have anything to do with um, what is supposed to be important to us in a, in a broader sense. So. Um, the, the thing that irritates the poo out of conservatives mm -hmm. when they look, I know that's a very technical term, poo. <laughs> conservative poo irritation. Um, um, you, you'll often hear that the reason that African American children have an achievement gap in school is because they are teased by other African American children for academic achievement. And so you'll hear them say things like, oh, um, you know, little, J little Jamal did not succeed because little Leroy called him white, right. right? Okay, so I just wanna break this down real quickly. Nearly every person who's ever told me a story about being teased um, about their diction or their cultural choices or anything told me this story of childhood teasing from a seat in my college classroom. Like, like literally almost everyone was like, they teased me for being too white. Like said that to me at the right. University of Chicago, at Princeton, <laughs> right. at Tulane. So right. although there may be painful personal experiences there, there's clearly not holding back from right. achievement, right? right. So that's the first. Because they're there. Because right. right. there they are, right? There they are. Um, the, this, the second thing is, um, does anybody think that Bill Gates or Steve Jobs were popular? 
right, right, no, right, right, right. right. So, so the, so you know, one of the truths of statistics is you cannot explain a variable with a constant. So, if all smart children, black, white, and otherwise, are teased ruthlessly for being smart achievers, and yet some go on and become Bill Gates, and others go on. Um, and don't, right? right? Then you, you got to look for something other than that constant to explain it, right? right? right, right. But I think the thing that really irritates them, the, the thing they really just can't get their heads around, is the idea that white could be an insult. Because what it suggests is that someone's like, okay, that's it's funny. <laughs> Right? That, you know, yes, you control all the resources, all the power, all mm -hmm. the political influence, all mm -hmm. that, but, but over here, we have a set of things that we measure each mm -hmm. other by right. that are not those things over yeah. there. Yeah. And I, you know, like I was watching all the Soul Trains post, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. that was like a whole, I don't know, what is the longest running music show in history. In history. And it was all about, we don't really care what white people think is cool. Yeah. Well, see, and that, we just don't be cool in a whole you know, entirely and that, other way and over that's, here. That was, I mean, it, that's kind of what um, Black Cool is about. And actually, um, my little cranky essay really talks about, um, about that, that, like the value of cool and that, it, that a white gaze takes the cool out of things. So, and that that is currency for us, that is an intelligence for us, that black cool is an intelligence that is ours. And it, it does make people uncomfortable. It, it, it does. Poo. It makes them so uncomfortable, they'll create an entire educational policy who every single school's only responsibility is not actually to teach you anything mm -hmm. except to conform to the other norms, to literally kill the cool in kill you. It, but we can't, it, it don't die. No, I know, but that, but that's right. But, but in the meantime, but like, that's rather the than, goal. Rather than just teaching cool kids to read, right, right? The idea is to is to kill the cool because if they could right. just conform, so like that. That's why that politics of respectability is so dangerous. It is because it, is. it literally yeah. can take away the, the what I think of as as the very resources that we have. Yeah. So. This is the part in the program where I do what we call the ten. I ask ten questions to our um, conversationalist, very much like the um, Inside Actor Studio. And after that, we get into the community conversation. So I'm at that part now. So you can start to think about your questions. And there's, um, there are um, microphones on either side for, for your questions. So, oh, I can't, I'm giving the tent to Melissa. Okay. This is exciting. OK. So what was your favorite toy or game as a child? Oh. I really like trouble. Um, you know, you pop. <laughs> no, seriously. You know, you pop it and then you go around. Yes, yeah. I really. I played a lot of hours of trouble. You can tell a lot about a person by their by their <laughs> game of choice. Trouble, right? Here. Yeah, that's true. I did. I played a lot. That of is hours so of funny. We're we'll gonna talk about that later. So, um, what were you afraid of when you were a little girl, and what are you afraid of now? Oh. Um. Hmm. Gosh, how I had a very sheltered childhood in certain ways. Um, probably, like, I, I can remember being really afraid kind of um, in my late elementary years, like third, fourth, fifth grade. My mom went mm -hmm. through lots of periods of un and underemployment. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being being very afraid of like losing the house. We didn't right. we didn't own a house, we rented. But right. but of being kicked out or of like losing the place that we might live. And I didn't I didn't feel that in like kindergarten, first, second, third. But at the at the end, just before my mom and I moved, um, when I was in middle school, she was really experiencing a lot of employment mm -hmm. um, difficulties. And so I can remember feeling a lot of angst about that. Um, and gosh, you know, the thing I'm probably most afraid of now is failure, um, which mm. is which is probably why I pursue it. So, I mean, um, part of, you know, my thing around shame is the only way you get over shame is to just kind of throw yourself out there. Yes. And yeah. so because I'm so afraid of failure, I just like take on bigger and bigger projects where I'm more likely to fail <laughs> more and more spectacularly <laughs> in front of more and more people. Um, so as to somehow manage the, the fear of it. Yeah. If, if you could cure one chronic social injustice, what would that be? Just one, huh? <laughs> yeah. One chronic social injustice. 
Well, I mean, I almost want to say I would just make everyone actually call President Obama President Obama instead of like, <laughs> but that, but that seems, that seems too small. That seems like I'm thinking too small. It's just the one that's, that's bothering me the most today. That's all right. Um, that's, that's a good answer to that. <laughs> but, that um, yeah, you know, I, I think, I think, the, I think it would be, um, I think it would be inequity in schools. Like, like yeah. for me, um, you know, I, I don't know how, like how you would take away racism or sexism. I mean, those would be big ones, but, um, for me, if there was, if, if it was just completely clear that every five-year-old had the exact same, you know, opportunity for quality education as every other five-year-old, that would that would work for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what woman in history would you like to have a conversation with? And no, I know that one. Okay. That's Ida B. Wells. Oh, like right now, yeah. it's been all Ida all the time. Right. About the past. <laughs> The past six weeks, I have been reading a lot. Uh, you know, Paula Giddings has the, the brilliant um, biography of Ida Wells, Sword mm -hmm. Among Lions. Um, and it's, you know, it's about that huge. And at first I looked at it and I kind of, you know, set it down and then I've, but, you know, Ida went through, she went through it. No hashtag there. She went, she went through it and, and she shopped the whole time. Like one of the things I love about Giddings' descriptions of Ida is how imperfect she is. Mm -hmm. So like at various points, she's like freedom fighting and, but then she'll take her whole paycheck and blow it on a bag. And then she will write a letter like, <laughs> oh Lord, I have spent my whole paycheck on a bag. My family is going to be hungry. <laughs> Everything about her for all of those reasons. She's fantastic. Yeah. Um, what, is, what are your um, what are your dreams for the next generation of women of color? Like for for the all the young sisters that are out here. What are, what are you dreaming for them? And Parker. Yeah, I know. I was gonna say that. You know, it's a it's a big one because because um, I'm you know I'm raising Parker and watching her go through. Um, things that just shouldn't, like, I mean, are we still doing hair? I mean, it's, it's 2012. Oh, yeah. We're yeah, I mean, hair. it's 2012 and we're still, like, having core what is on our head pain. Yeah. Um, so we never got to, I mean, to, this is, we never got to the root of it, really. Really, really? No. Really, we haven't. So until it's healed, it's going to keep coming back. It's going to keep coming back to ask to be dealt with. And black hair is a repository for all our dreams and pain and history and everything. everything. Okay. And so. everything. And everything. So, um, but, but honestly, um, for me it would be, if, if I could imagine a world where there was no sexual assault, period. Like if I knew that my daughter and every daughter could just, that it would never happen. Right. Like that I never had to think about it or face it or try to think about how I was gonna talk to her about it or prepare her for it right. or manage it or. Like she just skipped to school. Like that just was never, that just was an, an right. impossibility. That's, that's what it would be. Where do you look for inspiration? And, and where do you go for protection? Where do you go to feel safe? Oh, to my husband. I know it's a no. terribly unfeminist no. answer. It really <laughs> is. It's As a she puts up her big I wish, I wish oh. it were some other answer. I do, I do. <laughs> or sometimes I just like, you know, just purposely just like, eh, be mean to him. Just like, I'm a feminist. I can't like you this much. <laughs> but I do, I really... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that like that. I'm sorry, I didn't even really mean for that one to pop out like that. Um, but yeah, t to to feel safe like that's that's, that's very right. much a kind of James space. Um, yeah. You know, my my very best girlfriend in the world, who mm -hmm. if you are a Twitter follower, you know, like Blair and I, she is my bestie, bestie. Um, but Blair is not safe because Blair <laughs> because Blair always asks more of you. Like Blair is like, uh, oh, I'm sorry you feel bad. And tomorrow you will do what? You know, she's she's like she's the inspiration. She's the push, right? right? So so of those two, when you say who, where would you go for inspiration, it would very much be that Blair is incredibly inspiring and that she pushes oh, pushes. So, yeah. But like James was like, it's all right. I mean, at one point I said to him, I'm never going on TV again. He was like, okay, that's fine. Come on here. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> right, but, but Blair wouldn't. Blair would be like, what? You have a plan. You are going on TV again. Right, right? So, right. And you, you sort of need a, you a need of You need that balance. So, Melissa Harris-Perry, what makes you beautiful? Oh, man. Well, it, it probably is because I am irrepressibly myself, even mm -hmm. when I try really, really hard not to be. Mm -hmm. Like, I just come, like, pushing out the sides eventually. <laughs> And what is it that you can't live without? Man, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, the past four weeks, mm -hmm. red wine. Mm 
But... <laughs> <laughs> you guys are my throat up there. <laughs> but for a more uplifting answer. No, that, you, you, got, you got a what, what over there for that one. That, that um, might actually just be the answer. Okay, that's okay. all right. That's what it is today. And what makes you powerful? Um, the, the team, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's definitely yes. like both, both the home team, like Parker and James, yeah. right? That are like the team. Yeah. Um, and, and my mom, and then like I'm thinking right now, I was late getting over here, mm -hmm. but as much as I was late getting over here, there are 12 people right now, like writing for me, for set, like we were right. working, working, working to the last second, and right. I ran out, but they're still writing. So at every point, there's always a team. team. I mean, that's part of the point of the acknowledgements is yes. that nothing, nothing, happens nothing is powerful without like a whole crew of people yeah i, I know that's right I, I got a whole crew right there yeah. in the striped <laughs> sweater <laughs> um this is my favorite question so melissa harris perry who do you think you are oh. yes oh man well <laughs> i mean apparently <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I am a whole TV show, which is really Yay! no, it's really weird. Yay! <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I did I did not choose that name. I find it ex extremely bizarre that the show and I have the same name. And and at one point, someone well, Rachel said Rachel Show is her name. It's the Rachel Maddow Show. That's true. See how it's a different ah. There's yeah. Rachel, and then there's the Rachel Maddow Show. show right. My show was named Melissa Harris Perry. So there was a conversation at one point, oh, like, many, does many it have a hyphen? I was like, I don't know. Did it get married? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it, so it, it has my name, which is a weird sort of like, like taking my identity in a way that I find very strange. But apparently that's who I, like, I am, I am two hours on Saturday and Sunday, 10 to noon. Eight. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, and that, and that's. And that starts this weekend. So aren't we lucky to have this conversation with her before? So, okay, so now it's your turn. The, 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 here are the mics. You can, nothing's off the table. Um, thank you so much. Thanks. Of course, I was really looking forward to this conversation. It's wonderful. And I'm so proud of you, you. Uh, Dr. Harris Perry. And of course, I'm proud of you, <clears throat> Michaela. And um, well, I had two quick questions. One is my piece actually on ebony.com about you <laughs> just oh. came out today. So oh. y'all check on ebony.com, thank you. And, but it's actually about, it's, it's entitled, um, A Black Woman's Life of, of the Mind is Her Own. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you if you would talk a little bit about how you see um, your ideal academic hmm. situation and where you see the academy going for sisters like us who have witnessed everything that you've been through, and you've mm -hmm. definitely held it down. Um, but, what, what, but what's the ideal situation? What do you yeah. dream about for us? And the second question, quickly, is just, um, what do you think about black Twitter? <laughs> oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. OK, so um, on the first one, I mean, that's, that is really hard. And um, part of what makes it so difficult um, is sort of watching both my own experiences in the academy and my best girlfriend Blair's, right? Mm -hmm. So I have at every point taught at a well-resourced private institution where I always had, even when, even when it seems like I just am being attacked, I, it's never that way, right? I always have like a team, like a whole mm -hmm. crew of lions standing there and helping me and pushing and making all kinds of things possible. And then there's my best girlfriend Blair who is I think most days, smarter than me, more diligent than me, more careful than me, at least as insightful, often more, like one third of what I say are insights gleaned from conversations with Blair. And she has always been at an under-resourced public university and has not had the senior colleagues doing for her what so many of my senior colleagues did for me, right? So my first academic job, I was up under Michael Dawson and Kathy Cohen. And Michael Dawson is one of the very few, there were a few, there was, um, like when I think about the only people who I'm really sad are missing this weekend, mm -hmm. there's only a few and one of them is Manning. Like right. Manning not being here for this weekend makes me very sad because I would have asked Manning what to do. And I would have asked Manning what to do about the other stuff that happened and Manning, and Manning would have told me. Because there were a few people, Michael Dawson, Manning, Marable, a few black men in the academy who never treat you like their daughter or their date, never. They Whoa. only treat you like their colleague, right. right? And that's who Michael was to me and to have that, 
was, was my expectation then of, of what I would encounter in the world. So for me, I think part of what I would say is I, I wish that the academy was for, for all black women scholars and for all scholars, period, much of what it has been for me. That, that you know, there's always going to be. I mean, that's, you know, that's just how it is. But if, if people had around them so much of what I've had, which is to say feminist colleagues that in both male and female bodies, people who um, open doors for you without asking anything for themselves, people who read your work when it was garbage and saw the little nugget of insight in it and focused on the little nugget of insight and not the garbage that was all around it. I mean, I can remember John Aldrich saying to me my first year of graduate school, you know, Melissa, I think you might be really good as a political scientist. I mean, I remember that because I walked around with that for the rest of my career. It's like John Aldrich told me, I think you might be really good at this. And, and like, we're so engaged with being critical that we fail to just say, you know, yes, you wrote seven pages and six and a half were nonsensical, but this insight right here might turn into something valuable. And so like if, if I could imagine an academy, it would be an academy that did that, and especially an academy where it was not exclusively black women scholars who had to do that for up and coming black women scholars. Because I also used to think that all the black women tenured professors who I was encountering as a grad student were horrible. Like I thought they were mean and nasty, and some of them but many of them were, were just protecting themselves in ways that I now recognize, like they just, because we were eating them, because we needed them so bad. We're like, please, 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 please. And so they had, you know, they had kids from the entire campus at all points sitting. I mean, I sat outside by Nima Lubiano's door like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Lubiano must have had something else to do. And I was just in her face at all points, right? Yeah. And, and, and so, so I guess that, that would be it. And you know, Twitter, I love to, like I go to Twitter, I come back from Twitter, I have to be really careful not to believe Twitter, because Twitter will tell you. Die. Well, and Twitter would tell you to do things that you shouldn't do, like, go on TV and say, bye. You shouldn't do that, right? But, um, but overall, actually, I find Twitter to be a really interesting place for generating ideas. I find it very democratic with a little d, and I, and I like that about it. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I am Mia Dunlap. I don't know if you remember me, but I was in your Mia, class I at the university. Oh, I remember you so well, and I'm so thrilled that you are here. That's I was that student gleaming at your door and at your... <laughs> <laughs> Which is, of course, why I remember at you. At 13 years old. Um, so I'm here, and I'm, I'm really excited to... Y'all gotta understand, Mia was in my class, like, not, not my college, like, like... Right. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. 13 years old. Okay, yes. so... Uh, we, we are, I'm here, I'm, we're, it's young, there are young people here, uh, and we're just wondering what should we be doing, what can we be doing uh, in this upward mobility. We hear all these things about uh, where the Martin, Dr. Martin Luther Kings of our generation or the Malcolm X's of our generation, right? So what should we be doing now and what can we be doing? Oh my God, I don't know. I'm sure you know better than me. I mean, I'm, I'm so, like, one of the things that, um, I, Y'all are trying to just mess up. I cannot believe Mia Dunlap is here. Um, <laughs> I, I assume that um, the, the very fact that you say to me, there are some young people here, can you tell us what to do? Right. Is first of all evidence that I'm apparently no longer one of the young people. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is really, it's kind of hard for me to take for a second. Um, um, but it's also evidence that I probably don't know. Like I've been having this, I've been having this um, ongoing conversation about like what do you need to teach black kids about racism, right? And there's you know there's the know your history part, and there's the wanting to talk about structural inequality and the ways in which racism has operated historically. But I also don't want to assume that the racism that you will encounter or that my daughter Parker will encounter is the same racism, right? Mm -hmm. And so in certain ways, yes, I can teach her about my racism, but I can't teach her about hers. She will actually have to teach me back about hers because she's encountering a whole series of things that I don't know. So, um, you know, if we are, for example, you know, saying, oh, the, the um, you know, we did, we did away with Jim Crow, so therefore, you know, black youth go out and do whatever you need to do because we've done away with Jim Crow, we've got you the right to vote, and you're raising your hand and saying, well, I don't know, but it, maybe you haven't noticed the prison industrial complex. You guys didn't so much do away with that, and that's having this huge impact on me, right? So I guess what I would say is when I think about what I would like to see happening among black young people is I would really like to see black young people stop blaming themselves for the set of circumstances in which they find themselves. One of the things I really 
dislike is when black young people will say, well, if we were more motivated or mm. if we were, um, you know, if we listened better in class, or if we, I, I just, I've encountered so many very privileged white young people who don't do that to themselves, mm -hmm. um, who get high mm -hmm. and come to class and become, you know, Supreme Court justices, right? Like they, right. they don't, they, because they, 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 they have a sense that they have a right as young people to be, to fail sometimes, to be, young. To be experimental, yeah. <laughs> to be young, to move through the world. So, I mean, I think that's part of it is like, I, I just, I, I hate to see how much we police young, black young people and encourage black young people to police themselves. Because I assume that you have like a whole, like expansive um, hugeness about you. So, so here's the last thing I would say. Um, stop letting people come and talk to y'all. Like, oh, everyone wants to go talk to the young people. I'm gonna talk to the young people, tell the young people. Um, you, should, you should like not allow any of those people to ever come anywhere around you. Um, <laughs> really, really the impulse should always be, I would like to go listen to some black young people. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go listen mm -hmm. to some, I wonder what some young people would have to say to me. And this is, um, mm -hmm. this is part of what we've talked about for the show mm -hmm. is, you know, a lot of political conversation these days is about, oh, the deficit is going to burden our young people or young people need this or that. And almost no one actually bothers to talk to someone mm -hmm. under 30 right. on air. Right. And so, you know, part of what we've been talking about is trying to think about useful ways to actually right. stop and listen mm -hmm. to what young people and, and I would add that you create community, be with each other and tell the truth and support each other. But like have, like, cause she's noted like her girl, Right? How many times did you talk about Blair? Like, I think it's important that, that yeah. you get your girls or your boys or your friends create your own community and tell the truth when yeah. you talk about things. First of all, I'd just like to thank you, and I'm just so happy to be here to see you. I did run into you in Florida in the airport <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> and um, I, my question is to you, um, this business with Cornell West and how would you like to address that? Because I really want you to, like, his, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, his negative statements about you and acquiring your show and such. And I just wonder if you have any ideas of what you think may be going on with him because he's been a little off the hook lately. So I just want to know what, you, what, what do you think? So, um, so I, I, I mean, like, I, I have made a decision. I'm not going to address it, for example, in writing or in the press or, or anything like that. That said, I, I feel like that's, a, that's a, a question offered in good spirit, and so I'll, I'll just offer this. I, I really, when I say I don't know, I really honestly don't know. Um, uh, Professor West and I have had a, a long-term academic relationship that has included a lot of disagreement about politics in various ways. Mm -hmm. but, um, but we disagreed with each other politically um, before I came to Princeton University. So it's not as though I came and then we began disagreeing. We'd, we'd had what I think of as a very spirited, ongoing um, set of disagreements. It, it seems clear to me from what I read that he believes I have in some way betrayed him. I mean, that's like when I, when I read that, I, I feel like he thinks I've done something that is a betrayal. I don't know what, I, when I tell you I don't know, I literally do not know what that is. I know what I might be able to say I felt like was a, was a betrayal from him, right? But I don't know what it is he feels like I did that betrayed him. Because I, because I don't know how he characterized that relationship or, or any of that, right? So I, honestly, I don't know. Um, what I will say is I do find it very, very personally hurtful. And, and I say that in this context because I, um, you know, part of what the book is about is pushing back against the, the notion of a strong black woman. And so I don't want to appear to be impervious to any of this. Right. You know, I, I have cried many, many times from the time that I found out that the African American Studies program, not the, not the Lily White Department of Politics that has never had a full professor in its entire history since, since the 1700s, that, that program that has never had a black full professor since the 1700s voted to promote me to full professor. The Center for African American Studies chose not to. That was excruciatingly painful. Mm -hmm. And then to find out, as I had no knowledge of previously, um, in an article, right, because no one ever told me anything about the vote. And then to find out in a public article that that was a unanimous vote of every colleague that I had there, that no colleague that, I've, that I ever had there at any time has ever, at any point since I've left that university, so much as sent me an email that said, you know, congratulations, good luck, best wishes, it was nice knowing you, Not, nothing. 
And so that's not Professor West, right? He, 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 he's a very powerful and important man, but he can't, he doesn't control the entire, you know, university, right? So, so I don't, so I clearly must have done something or did nothing or did something that was unrelated. I really don't know. But I, I will just say that like, I, I would never want to give out the notion that it's not painful to experience loss and betrayal mm -hmm. and public hurt. It mm -hmm. is. And then you take a breath and you kind of go on, right? But you know, it's, not, it's, not a fun, uh, it's not a fun experience. Uh, one last thing I'll say about it. I absolutely believe in the relative autonomy of ideas from the personalities of the people who have them. And so any person who thinks, well, Cornell West, I disagree with him, or I dislike how he's talked to Professor Harris Perry, so I'm never gonna read Race Matters again. I'm not, it, that, that is a hashtag fail. Mm -hmm. Like, um, <laughs> you know, um, race matters and prophecy deliverance are important, important. intellectual contributions no matter what. It, it's like saying, you know, screw the Declaration of Independence because Thomas Jefferson was a slave master. Kiss my ass. Mm -hmm. That slave master wrote that it is that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he said it was self-evident. That, that sentence matters no matter who said it. Like, period. That, that idea is an inherently valuable idea in human history, as are so many of the ideas that Cornell West offered, particularly in his early work. So that, I mean, I think that's, that's all I would. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, congratulations uh, yet again on your show. I'm really excited to be here and I will be brief. Um, I, I don't want to be too controversial, but I do work with young people. I work at Columbia University, um, so I'm surrounded by them all day. And I am in the process of reading your book. And I have to say that I, I was a little struck um, a little bit about what you wrote in the book as well as what you said here about the politics of respectability. I do run a program called Sister Circle where we talk a lot about how stereotypes, we had a, a, a conversation about, you know, the ish media says about women of color, stere you know, Asian dolls, Jezebels, and um, uh, spicy Latinas. And a yep. lot of pain came out of that. And a lot of stereotypes that came up about, you know, um, I have to kind of code switch or do X, Y, or Z in order to be uh, taken seriously. And to a certain extent, I feel, and my students have said, there is some, there's some truth and validity to that. So I'm just wondering if you could talk whether or not you feel like there is some positive aspects of this politics of respectability, not necessarily in earning citizenship, but just about how we present ourselves and how others perceive us in this idea of recognition. Sure, sure, sure. So code switching is like learning a second language. And, and I think one ought to, or, or even being fluent in the language of, of one's country, right? So I code switch all the time. President Obama is an exquisite code, a code switcher. Code he is like, <laughs> yes, he is. He's absolutely a ninja code switcher. So no, no, one is, right, no one is suggesting that we shouldn't particularly arm young people with the tools of code switching, but even the fact that, that you can label it as that is indicative that you're not performing the policies of respectability. Because what you're not doing is saying, this is what is good, conform yourself to it, what you're saying is this is what it's, it's, is expected, perform this, right? And when you help people recognize that they're actually performing it, like if you actually put on a mask, you're not experiencing it the same way as like if it's molded onto your face and you can't breathe through it. And so, so no one is suggesting that we don't teach those tools. What I am saying though on stereotypes is really important in this sense. It doesn't matter if you're not a whore Jezebel will exist as a stereotype that will be used against you as a weapon, period. It doesn't matter if you're not a mammy. Mammy is a stereotype that exists that will be used against, like you can't behave your way out of it. When they arrested Henry Louis Gates in his house, like if you ever thought that the politics of respectability would save you, mm. that should have reminded you that it cannot. There, there is no more respectable Negro in all of America <laughs> than Henry Louis Gates. That, that, there just isn't. He I mean, there's a just, bow tie, for real. I mean, he rides a tricycle through Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> That's not, that is not a joke. That is an empirical <laughs> description. And they arrested him. He, He's the head of the, du I mean, like whatever you thought you could respectable your way out of, no. Right. When, when, I, when I read it on Twitter, I was like, they must mean like Cornell or Dyson or like, like there are black professors who had they been arrested, I'd be like, well. Right. <laughs> that seems about right. But Skip, 
right? So, 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 that, so that's, that's the only thing I, I guess I'm wanting to push. Like, you teach the code switching, but then you also teach that, that is, that's actually not you, and that performance of it can't save you from the realities that come down. Because the danger for me is if, when we, for example, accept the mantle of the strong black woman, then we don't ask for help, because who needs help if you're impervious, right? right. And right. so I want us to feel like we have, every, like, I'm not a whore. I'm a single mom who needs a higher food stamp although there's no such thing as them anymore. And of course, Newt Gingrich actually did away with food stamps, so he knows there's no such thing as food stamps, which is why it's funny when he talks about the food stamp president, because he's actually the architect of the end of the thing called food stamps. But if one said, look, my children are hungry, and I'm a single parent, and this is an economy where black people have 25% unemployment, then I'm going to need you to help me out as a citizen. But, but we, like the idea of asking for an improved living wage for single black is so beyond the pale because, it, because we can't even get past like, well, you shouldn't have had those babies. Hi. Hi. I want to say congratulations on the book and the show. Thank you. Um, I know a couple of us are really going to watch it. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you and pick your brain on a question that um, I've had numerous conversations with my friends about is the popularization and, and the change of hip hop culture into pop culture mm -hmm. that now we have the McDonald's through 60 commercials and they're rapping car auto commercials and yeah. the dollar how, band. Yeah. Like, <laughs> how do you feel about it? Is it like a relieving sense? Like finally hip hop culture is being recognized as, you know, something current and active mm -hmm. or is it kind of um, insulting in the, in the change that it's made to a cartoon typecast situation. Right. I mean, so this is the part where I'm old, right? Because I basically <laughs> think that Tribe was the last quality hip hop that was produced, <laughs> right? Um, and so, um, so like, I, but I get that that is my, you know, I get that every person who's older always looks at all young people's music and finds it, you know, a, right, preposterous, right? Ridiculous. Except that I do like Nicki Minaj. And I don't care what you say, and that's why I don't have a politics of respectability, because I like Nikki. Um, uh, you, know, you know, the commercial aspects of it um, are, are in certain ways, they're almost true with a capital T. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's more a part of, um, you know, the McDonald's commercials or something now, but so are lots of aspects of blackness. Um, you know, so hip hop is part of it, but also is like the McDonald's Black History Month facts and, um, and you know, like the Black McDonald's Owners Association. And I mean, there's all, you know, in like um, the revolution brought to you by McDonald's and Walmart and Wells Fargo vis-a-vis, -vis, yeah. you know, Tavis Smiley or something, right? So there's, there's all kinds of ways in which, um, uh, the embeddedness of everything, everything that is uniquely American was created by black culture. And so it's not really that, that's probably a, a, a slight overstatement because I'm a little punchy, but pretty close to that, right? I mean, jazz, blues, hip hop, everything that just actually got created here and didn't get imported um, happened in the black Atlantic diaspora of blackness in a global way, right? So it's not just like American domestic Negroes, but black Negroes with, you know, West Indian ones and African ones and you're know, doing the whole thing that is the black Atlantic. So the fact that it becomes American when it is so American sort of makes me shrug. Um, I'm, like I'm not that terribly surprised by it, but what you could always bet is that then there will be a backlash against it, right? So um, we're seeing it now with Linsanity. All right, so I love Lynn Sandy. Who wouldn't love Lynn Sandy? This is great. It's basically bringing like the, everything we love about college basketball to pro basketball. Like the, the idea that something amazing could happen never happens in pro basketball. Right. But it's getting read in this cultural way that he's going to be this model minority that will teach you know all of these out of control black men with all this swagger how to like bring their game and their selves back in line. Now. Black swagger is what makes the NBA the multi-million dollar Word. affair Say that. that it is. Say that. Right? I mean, that, that, that actually is the thing that makes all those white men rich is the black swagger. But, it's, but you can bet that they're going to both co-op it and police it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, so they're going to, so, and I, I guess, so for me, I would just want to be aware of that. Like, I don't want to stop it. I just want us to be able to read that so when we see it happen, we go, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to root for Lynn and y'all are not going to talk about my, you know, the brothers that way, right? Like both of those at the same time. Hi, so we have time for two more questions. Okay, One on each. all right, okay. and I'll go faster. Hi, Hi. Russ, oh, no, it's your turn. Oh, I'm sorry, I got excited. Good. That's my so, friend so, so. Russ over oh, there. Oh, okay. Hi, Hi. Um, I teach high school English in a district that believes it's suburban, but it's urban. And, <laughs> and um, this, is a, this is a district where the volleyball 
participants felt that it was okay to name themselves South and put 1860 on the back of their shirts, okay? How do I help the girls and the boys, actually? I mean, we had such an uproar about this. The student, of course, all the black students said, they're not gonna get punished, and they didn't. They, didn't, they weren't suspended. Had it been us, we would have been suspended immediately for 10 days and blah, 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 blah. But the principal actually got on the PA system the next day and made the apology for the players of the volleyball team. You know, what do I do? And my, the, the black kids that I have, you know, they're almost oh, Campbell, you're always teaching us about black history and you always want, you need to know, trust me, what I'm teaching you, okay? And they are fighting it tooth and nail, but yet they'll get so angry when something like this happens. So, so okay, I'm sorry. So they called themselves. Right. They were initially going to call themselves the Rednecks, but that was, they, wow. they were told that they couldn't do that. Okay, so they called themselves the South. They South, just put South. And then they, then the 1860s. So right. we know a couple things, right? Yeah. They actually know when the Civil War occurred. <laughs> Good okay. job, history teachers at your school. <laughs> and then they aligned themselves with the team that lost. Right. Right. They're, they're an athletic team, correct? Yes. Okay. But it's, it's, it's volleyball, so. Right, right. So they... <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not really sure why y'all are mad. Like, I feel I like... <laughs> I mean, like, I feel like y'all should wear a shirt to say North, 1864. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm... Like, I'm So, I mean, I'm sorry, I, don't, I mean, like, I don't mean to make light of it, but, but I no, will say, I, yeah, I mean, I, I will just say, look, yeah. um, th this will be true. The, the fact that, um, and, and I think it's part of what belies the notion of us in a post-racial America, and, and this is why. Because their, their knowledge of that cultural artifact, of that ability to do that, is indicative that people are continuing to be socialized into racism. So the, the, the most exquisitely interesting thing about the Jenna Louisiana moment for me was well, not so much that it happened, but why would kids of that age know the lynching news? Right. Like, why, why would that be available as a trope? Like, what, um, there hasn't been a lynching of that sort, right? There, was, there have been some modern lynchings, but they, they weren't lynchings, you know, on the tree sort for a very long time. And, and, and as you undoubtedly know, we don't teach it really right. in school. Right. So where did that right. come from? How does someone know that trope? How do young people know to deploy racism in those particular ways? It tells us that there's an active process of socialization right. into racism, right? right? right. And so, right. you know, so because that's happening, because that's true, so they, when, when I was in college, um, the black fraternity, first black fraternity got a, a house on the yard and uh, in response one of the white fraternities went over to the, the porch and, and lynched squirrels, right? So there were all these hanging oh. squirrels, right? And it was, you know, it was the 90s. And um, <laughs> we were listening to Tribe. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, again, it was one of those moments where, you know, we wore the black armbands and we were mad and all that. But the fact is, I, now being on college campuses, I mean, it's, it's rhythmic. Like every mm. year, there's going to be some experience where young white people who should be, at this point, two to two and a half generations out from even knowledge of these things, not only do it, but they deploy it Thank in these you. really, what I find hilarious, like I think South 1860 yeah. is hilarious. hilarious. So, so all I will say is, you know, you need the North 1864 shirt or or take the Confederate flag and recast it in red, black, and green and put the South shall rise again. <laughs> <laughs> and just I want to keep my job. <laughs> okay, I have to. So Thank look, you. because so rarely men ask questions, I'm going to, I'm going to stretch this and, and have Russ and uh, also ask a question so we can, so both be, so everybody brief so we can get the two brothers in. Good evening. Um, so I uh, am very excited and been a huge fan for a long time as someone who's worked in television. Um, but I also understand, I'll keep this short, there's a business side to what you do. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, so two-part question. What is the measure of success for the executives who, um, are supporting your show yeah. and understand that smart TV takes smart people. Yeah. And what is your measure of success for this show? And is there a, a gap between the two? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good, good question. question. So, um, and, and this is, you know, I, I'm relatively naive of a lot of this stuff, but I, like, I just got it today, so I'm telling you all kinds of inside business I'll undoubtedly be fired for, but, um, <laughs> so, like, I found out today, you know, we're launching the show Saturday, and as you might imagine, we have been thinking about every minute of what this show is going to sound like and be like, we're writing, we're doing, we're researching, we're pulling, and, and um, you know, the show runs 10 a.m. to noon. Anybody know what's happening at 11.30 on Saturday morning? Wait. So I've been given an edict about what happens at 11.30 Saturday morning on my show. Yeah. Um, now, luckily, this particular edict comes with an ability to talk about really interesting things that I care about, race and gender and popular culture. And po I mean, Whitney Houston is um, actually a worthy reason to pause and think about all of these things and, and can still open up lots of conversations. Mm -hmm. But whether or not it will open up conversations or whether or not I'm gonna have to actually turn into anchor girl and say, there is the hearse driving through the I mean, it seems like more than slightly possible that, that's, that that is going to be what will happen because what's going to happen is I'm going to be on a cable television network and there will be an actual news event happening and all of our competitors are going to be doing wall-to-wall -wall coverage of it and you know I had planned and you're the black girl talking it's about <laughs> Whitney right and it's not even that like I swear, if, if it had been happening during Chris Hayes' show they just would have broken to Chris's it's just, she's but, just but there's a particular thing about you are the expert on black girls yes and this is America's sweetheart black girl that was really complicated and crack as whack black girl yes so you're you? Yes. Yeah. So this is so this is like so I am experiencing it like right at this moment. Yeah. And my sense of like, oh, and so we took the little segments that we were gonna do that day. We put them in a little folder, and now we're not doing those segments at that point. Is it ratings? Is it? I assume that for them it is ultimately ratings. Although there's a weird way that cable news works. It apparently is not purely about ratings, but something to do with pickup and blah blah mm -hmm. blah. And um, what I do know is I've been given sort of a six month window where they say, you know, nobody expects you to have ratings in the first six months because in the first six months if people don't even really know the show is on, blah, blah, blah. I literally don't know what the ratings are. I don't know where one finds them. I don't know how to look at them. I don't know what they mean. I'm actively trying to stay naive of them. Um, I think success for me would be um, getting fired pretty quickly because um, I have a two-year contract that has to pay me even if I don't go to work. And um, I'm a pretty strong believer that getting a paycheck if you are not traveling back and forth between New Orleans and New York is a very good measure of having made a successful life choice. That was a good one. <laughs> good evening. I'll make this really quick. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, it is clear that you are a thinker. And I think um, we could use more thinkers in this world. And it seems to me that your work is dedicated to making us and challenging, challenging us to think. So but, um, the thing about thinkers is, is when they're let loose, everything is at risk. So including why I wear what I wear, why I think what I think, why I'm a part of the community that I'm a part of, um, why I tend to associate with black people, not white people, not Asian people. So with that respect, um, my question is, how do you negotiate the relationship between, on one hand, being um, engaged in the free, disinterested thought that is designed to get to know yourself and grow yourself, and on the other hand, um, associating or, or wanting to be a part of this, these communities, these larger communities of woman, black woman, man, black man, and so forth. Yeah. You know, th again, that's not a small thing. Like I, um, as much as I was so thrilled to hear you, I am so nervous that y'all are going to hate some of the stuff that I do um, and expect you to and sort of want you to, right? I mean, there are moments when I'm going to actively hope that, that black women watching are going to be irritated by some of what I do because I'm trying to, I never, it's never disinterested, but, but I do like the idea of, of free. I wish the name of my show was Mad Free instead of <laughs> Melissa Sperry. Um, <laughs> but the thing is like you, you actually do feel that desire. I mean, you know, literally when I'm writing, sometimes I'm thinking to like, especially when I'm writing for the nation, I think to myself, okay, um, it is, if I'm saying what I, fully believe or think that data are showing me in this moment, but also wanting to balance that against the realities of all the 
power and politics. So the, the clearest example of this is how I deal with President Obama. Right, I mean, um, it, it will extend to how I deal with black women and all kinds of other things, but the fact is um, my opinions empirically or personally about President Obama do not exist in a vacuum of disinterested intellectual thought. They exist within a political milieu when we are in an election year and he's being attacked at every point and any criticism can be deployed in a way that I don't mean it to be. So I just had this kind of free-ranging conversation about LGBT questions with Metro Weekly where I said, oh, you know, I wish President Obama, basically President Obama would evolve already on, you know, marriage equality. Like I just, I don't, I actually don't even buy that President Obama isn't quite sure about marriage equality. Like I actually think that personally he's probably right there, but that like politically he won't be, and, and I kind of get why he won't be politically, but it irritates me. And so now that's, that is what I believe to be empirically true. It also is not without real political dangers and real political costs in this environment. And so I guess all I can say is I'm gonna be balancing them at all times and I'm gonna get them right sometimes and wrong sometimes, but always with the goal of at least making people feel like I didn't do it um, offhandedly or flippantly. That any choice I'm making, that I'm, that I'm actively making it as a choice, even if it may in any you know, given case end up being the wrong choice. Thank you. Wasn't this good, y'all? <laughs> Yay! I just, I just really want to thank the Brooklyn Museum again, because I mean, I know that all of you all come to the Brooklyn Museum, but they, they get the community, and you, you've, given us, you've given us space to have these conversations and share the work that we do, and you support the community, and you support us, and we love the Brooklyn Museum, so thank you. So on behalf of the Brooklyn Museum, I would like to thank both of you for what was truly an inspiring, engaging, thought-provoking conversation. So Melissa Harris-Perry, Michaela Angela Davis, thank you so much. And I also want to thank all of you for sharing your voices and for being open to participating so actively in this conversation. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that there's many counterpoints to the conversation that we just had in our special exhibition, Question Bridge, Black Male, which is on display on our second floor and will be, the conversation will be continued at what we're calling the Question Bridge Blueprint Roundtable on May 19th, which will be a community open forum to discuss many of the conversations that um, we've started here tonight and within the black male community as well.